welcome back. I hope you all uh, fill stomachs. Um, the next uh, lecture uh, we're going to present for you is actually a debut. And this is done by two very fine people I met in Holland uh, during the Open Mind Conference. Uh, the day after the conference, we all met in the park and you could discuss everything uh, uh, with people you yeah, thought you uh, could share some ex experience with. And there I met Simon and Joanne and we had a long talk. At that time, I didn't know that they were actually real warriors who uh, had tried to categorize their research in philosophy, in history, in logic, in politics, uh, all kinds of subjects, uh, and uh, write a book called uh, The TV Delusion. So this is actually um, a little bit of coincidence. We, we talked about that they, when we had all these cancellations, um, that the, it could maybe be a very interesting thing for them to tell the story about the book, tell the story about themselves, why they thought that this were so important that they have to put five years of research into a book. So give a very warm welcome to Simon Day and Joanna van der Leer. Okay, well, um, thanks to Frank, Frank for that uh, touching introduction. Um, so, um, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Go if de mede elazaman. So, um, with an accent like that, you'll be pleased to know the rest of the talk is in English. Um, anyway, so um, uh, my name is Simon Day, Simon Day, and I'm here with my friend and co-author Joanna Vandeleer, and um, we're going to talk to you for roughly about an hour today about our new book, The TV Delusion, uh, which came out a couple of months ago. Um, but before we kick off, uh, we'd just like to say a big thank you to uh, Frank and everyone here on the, on the staff for giving, this op giving us this opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, now, um, as Frank said, we've been to a couple of Open Minds before and as members of the audience, and um, we never dreamt that one day we'd be up here on stage, uh, but then again, we also never dreamt that we'd write a book either. So. I guess there's a synchronicity in everything. <laughs> um, so um, this is the first time we've done this, so uh, you'll have to excuse us both if it's a little bit rough around the edges. Um, we'll, we'll try and do our best. Um, now, um, I'm uh, an IT consultant by profession, and I suppose that means that uh, you could say I've got an analytical mind, and I approach the world from a, a point of view of the laws of physics, mathematics, and logic. Um, now, up until about five years ago, um, I'd never heard of what we might loosely call the truth movement. Um, um, I believed every word that came out of the TV. Um, I believed that we were the good guys, and by we, I mean the UK, the US, and our NATO allies. I believed that we were the good guys, and that we were permanently in, in war around the world, fighting the bad guys, the, the forces of evil whoever they might be at any particular moment. Seem to change a bit from now and again, but you never know. Um, so I trusted uh, the BBC, and I trusted what they said they were. I trusted that they were an independent and unbiased arbiter of the truth. Um, but um, like for many other people probably here today, um, that all changed for me uh, the moment I saw the video of the controlled demolition of Building 7. Um, because it, it occurred to me that it was weird how such a major deviation from the official narrative of 9-11 could have been completely avoided by all the TV channels. Um, and it's not like the footage is um, hard to find. It just takes a 10-minute search on the internet and you can watch it in, well, I was going to say a few minutes, but actually it only takes seven seconds to watch it. So <laughs> um, Anyone could do it any time they, they want. But what occurred to me about that clip and something I felt was more important 
was that um, I would have thought that news of that clip would have spread like wildfire around the world and everyone would know it very quickly. But that didn't seem to be the case. And um, after all, it, it had taken me the best part of 10 years to find it, so uh, quite a long time. <laughs> um, now, there are many people in the world today who've still never heard of Building 7 and um, they've never seen the clip. But even more important than this, I think, is the fact that so few people even want to see it. And for me, it's that not wanting to see it is the key thing, rather than having not seen it, if you see what I mean. Um, and this realisation that people didn't want to see it was the catalyst that um, started our work and culminated in our, our writing of our book. Now, I'm going to carry on with this story in a little while, but before I do, I'm just going to pause uh, for a moment and uh, let Jo introduce herself before we carry on. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today. So my name's Joanna Vandelier, as you probably gathered, and um, I've worked in the field of respiratory medicine for over 10 years now. Um, just like for Simon, 9-11 was a big event that got me to start questioning pretty much everything I thought I knew. Um, but the difference between us is that for me, it didn't really come as much of a shock. When I thought about why that might be, I remembered back to a time when I was about 12 years old. I started to get the sense that things just didn't quite add up. The stuff I was ta taught at school often seemed back to front to me, and I'd convinced myself at the time that this was just because I wasn't clever enough to understand what others did. And because I struggled quite a bit at school, this seemed to be an obvious reason to me. It took me some years to work out this, this may not have been the case. And I now realize that this may have been the start to my seeing through the illusion. So when I saw the footage of the two towers coming down on 9-11, I remember thinking that something about it seemed pretty odd, like it wasn't <coughs> real. It felt more like I was watching one of those American blockbuster movies than watching a real event unfolding. Um, but at the time, I, I believed everything the TV told me, and I had no reason to, to not believe them at all. So I accepted the TV narrative and didn't look into what had really happened until a lot later. So over 10 years later, over a pint in our local pub, Simon mentioned Building 7 and its collapse. I'd never heard of it before, so I went away and looked into it myself. Um, and I watched the footage from many different angles and quickly realized the official story could not be true and the TV had lied. After doing a bit of research, um, I came, became convinced that my gut feeling all those years ago had been right. And from that day on, I began to trust my gut instincts a lot more. I started to wonder how many others knew what I did and what their reactions had been to finding out. I thought, thought once my friends and family saw the evidence, they'd come to the same conclusion I had. But it didn't work out like I expected. Most of them were very dismissive and refused to look at any evidence at all. And I think this was more of a shock to me than 9-11 itself. It was a very isolating experience for me at the time, but I soon realized I wasn't alone. And I'm sure many of you here today have had similar experiences, and perhaps not even with 9-11, but with other, other things. Um, anyway, but importantly, what all this made me realize is that evidence alone is often not powerful enough to change a person's thinking. And this made me wonder, why would someone actively want to deny themselves the truth? So all these experiences and the questions that arose from them made me want to get involved in writing the TV delusion with Simon. I felt that if people could better understand the powerful hidden drivers that influence their thoughts and behavior, that this could make a positive difference. I'll now hand you back to Simon to carry on with his story. OK, thank you, Joe. That was um, excellent, thanks. <coughs> um, so uh, what we're going to do today is um, I'm going to take you through a couple of little bits of theory which under, underpin our book. And then after, hopefully that'll be quite brief because I don't want everyone to fall asleep. And um, after that, we'll move on to some practical examples. And uh, Joe's going to take over at that point. OK. So let me carry on then. So um, after I'd done a lot of research about 9-11, I figured to myself that there's no point in having a load of knowledge about something if you're not going to do anything with it. Um, so my first impulse, a uh, bit like for Joe, was to uh, tell all my friends about it. Um, and I just assumed they'd be interested to hear what I had to say. 
I assume they want to um, ask me questions um, about the research I'd done. But um, same as what Joe said, um, the reality of this was uh, extremely different. And um, that was the thing that came as a real surprise to me. So um, let's see some of the reactions I got. About to see if the technology works. Yep. OK, so these, this is just a list of some of the reactions I got when I tried to tell people. So a few people did fall into this category, the category which I'd expected. But this was about two to three people who wanted to ask questions. Um, now, moving on, the next group, disbelief. So this, was, this probably um, encapsulated the vast majority of the people. Um, they didn't really want to listen to anything I was saying. They didn't believe me. Um, and what they mostly did was dismiss the subject and try to change the subject onto something else. Um, OK. Now, the next group, scorn. Now, I got quite a lot of this. Um, people were scornful about the, the work I'd done. Um, th there was a lot of name calling and other quite uh, negative, semi-aggressive behavior. Um, and this is particularly painful for me, coming from uh, people who I'd previously considered to be uh, much more intelligent than I was. Um, so this was quite shocking. Um, so just for our benefit, can you put your hand up, please, in the audience, if you've experienced a reaction similar to this to anything? <laughs> oh, wow, quite a lot. <laughs> Good, I'm not alone. OK, so moving on then. Um, now, this last one, quite extreme, I, I'll grant you. And I actually only had one of these. But again, this came from someone who I'd previously regarded as being a friend. Um, one of them is quite enough for me, actually. So uh, I'm glad there was only one. So um, once again, just for my benefit, has anyone experienced this as well? Ah, lady. Yeah, same here. Yeah, Come and see us in the bar later. I'd like to buy you a drink and hear your story. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so um, when all this happened to me, um, a friend of mine who actually was in the first category of people, the, the questioners. Um, he said to me that it's quite natural for people to act with disbelief uh, when presented with new information, some, something they've never heard before. Now, I think there's probably some truth in what he said. Um, but for me, simple disbelief doesn't cover this broad range of behavioral response. Um, I just couldn't see how, if you disbelieve someone, you'd threaten to kill them. It just didn't make sense for me. And that's the kind of thing that, that kind of got me thinking, really. It was this uh, behavioral response rather than the actual events themselves. Um, now, this kind of, uh, you know, the, the last two behaviors are something which you'd expect to find from people who are either frightened or if they feel threatened. Now, you can't feel threatened by a piece of information, I don't think. So it occurred to me then that... Um, this could happen if someone was engaged in a belief system and they felt that their beliefs were under attack. And that, that could be the explanation for these um, extreme behaviors. And that's what first gave me the idea that it could possibly be that the TV was at the center of a modern day belief system. Okay, so um, let's move on then. So when I um, started thinking about all this, um, I remember a story, a, a college friend of mine had told me, um, and um, I'll come on to this in a minute. Okay, so I'll come on to a story that this uh, friend of mine had told me at college. Now, this is quite a while ago now. It was uh, back in the 1980s, and um, my friend had done, it was, at, uh, sorry, it was at a time when there were a lot of um, religious cults popping up all over the UK and possibly elsewhere, but I was only aware of the ones in the UK. And my friend had been to visit one of these cults in the north of England. And um, he'd gone there because the student newspaper had asked him to go and interview some people in the cult uh, in order that he could write an article for the, for the newspaper. So off he went, and uh, one thing led to another, and he ended up being sucked into the cult, and he got absorbed and lived there with them for six months. Um, eventually, his uh, parents had to have him kidnapped and broken out. Um, so, the first thing I asked him, uh, probably the first thing anyone would ask him, was, why didn't you just leave as soon as you realized you were being brainwashed? And um, he said that the reason was that the narrative they told him, uh, and by narrative I mean 
it, the story they told themselves about themselves and their place in the world. So the, the narrative they told them had been convincing and um, appealing. And it was appealing in such a way that he felt that he wasn't being brainwashed. And he, he, he didn't view himself as being brainwashed, so he just stayed. Um, so when he said this, uh, this kind of image came into my mind. Um, <laughs> sorry about the angry looking faces, by the way. It's all I, all I could find. Um, but now both of these guys think they're, they're right and think the other guy's wrong. And um, so I suppose you can imagine one of these as being a member of the cult, you know, my friend in this point, at point in time, and the other one being a follower of the narrative from the TV, uh, a so-called normal person. Um, normal, I thought, at the time. Maybe not so normal now. <laughs> um, alternatively, you could also view this as a person who can see the truth behind 9-11 and the, the many other uh, false flag and fake terror events, and a person who's absorbed in the uh, official TV narrative of those events. Um, so it's this kind of entrenchment that we get when we, have, we find two people who are um, engaged in different belief systems which contradict each other. Um, I've even found myself in this situation as well. I'm sure many people have as well. I don't think it's that uncommon. Um, so then I started thinking to myself, how could we go about resolving a conflict like this? Um, how can we tell which of these guys is right and which guy is wrong? Um, could it be that they're both right? And what, what happens if they're both wrong? Um, so each one's saying that their narrative is true. But what do we mean when we say something is true? What does the word true mean? If we have two people and they say that something's true, how do we know it means the same thing? Okay. So um, we started researching this, and it turns out there are many definitions of the word true. Um, now, many of them are quite philosophical in nature and probably outside the scope of what we've got to say here. But we felt that there were two different ones which were very, very common. And these are the two um, we focused on. So, um, so what is the truth then? So I'm going to go through um, two of the definitions, as I said. And the first one I'm going to cover is the one which most people would give if they're asked for a definition of truth. But as we'll see in a minute, um, weirdly, it's the one which is least often used in practice. OK, um, so the first one is called correspondence. And the correspondence theory of truth uh, says that something is true if it corresponds to an event in the real world or a state of the real world. Um, for instance, a simple example, if I say the sentence, it is raining, then it, that is true if it's actually raining and false otherwise. OK, so how does this work in more detail then? How can we break this down into steps? Um, I guess this is my IT background, just wanting to analyze everything. <laughs> um, so the first step is observation. Um, now, in order to work out if something corresponds to a real event in the real world, you have to first observe the real world. Um, so it has to start with this. Um, that's probably the most important bit. Um, so um, in, the, in the example of the rain, if someone says to us it's raining, the first step is to look out the window. It's obvious, right? OK, second step is um, hypothesis. So what we might do is we might form some hypothesis, some ideas about what's going on. So in the case of the rain, we might say, well, one possibility is that it's raining, assuming we can see drops falling. Another possibility is that someone might be watering their flowers in the flat above. Um, so. Once we've formed our hypotheses, we can move on to the next step, which is called evaluation. So in this step, we take each hypothesis in turn, and we use it to predict a set of hypothetical observations. And we compare those hypothetical observations with the real observations. And the, uh, the hypothesis that forms the predicted observation that most closely matches the real observation you'd say is the more true of the two. Um, so this is what we do in, this, in the uh, balance phase, where we weigh each up in turn, um, measuring that correlation. 
Once we've done that, we move on to qualify conclusion. So I've written the word qualified here because with this method, we must always accept that we can be wrong. If, if it turns out later that there's um, some more evidence comes to light, which we previously hadn't seen, or if someone comes up with a better hypothesis that fits the um, evidence better, then we have to change our mind and form a new um, opinion. Okay, so that covers the uh, first uh, model of truth. So I'm gonna move on now to the second one, which is, you'll see, is in some ways is the opposite. Okay. Second one is called uh, constructivism. So uh, the um, constructivist theory of truth tells us that something is true if some form of authority tells us it's true. Okay, so going back to the example of the rain, if someone tells us it's raining, then that's true if a person in authority tells us it's raining and it's uh, false otherwise. So, once as before, I'm going to analyze this one and break it down into steps. So, the first step is we call candidate conclusions. So, the first thing to note is that in the world around us, there are many sources of authority. And these come from a variety of places, and some of them are quite obvious, some of them are quite subtle, and some of them are quite unexpected. And I'm going to come on to a couple of examples of those in a minute. Um, but what we notice is that for most of us, um, our form of authority is the TV. And so to keep things simple for now, um, you, can, you can imagine these candidate conclusions as coming from different TV channels. So you've got your BBC, CNN, DR, and so on. But then you've also got um, sensationalist so-called alternative media, such as Infowars and the like. And each of these are presenting uh, narratives or conclusions. So, how do we choose which one we're going to select? Okay, so the way, we, the way we do this is by filtering out the unwanted sources of authority. And we, we call this authority filtering. So, um, for many of us, for many people rather, um, the BBC might always win against Infowars. But for other people, it might be quite, quite as easily the other way around. Um, so we build our authority filter by mimicking those of the people around us. M we mimic our peers and our colleagues at work, that kind of thing. And this is why we tend to find cultures all around the world where the inhabitants follow the same narratives and obey the same authority and conform to the same um, behaviours. And this is uh, one aspect of a, a subject called conformity, uh, which Joe's going to tell us um, a lot more about in a minute. So I'll move on, because I don't want to steal her thunder. <laughs> um, now, because we're focused on authority with this method of truth, um, we're focused on authority, we're focused on personalities. It can often lead us to the impression that the world is just one big personality cult. And we find that many people are focused not on what's being said, but on who's saying it. And they tend to be fixated by people's credentials, people's qualifications, people's job titles, and so on. Um, anyway, so moving on. Uh, once we've uh, adopted, selected our, our uh, source of authority, we have our conclusion, so we move straight on to absolute conclusion. Now, you notice I put the word absolute here this time. And for followers of this method of the truth, what they think is an ab the absolute truth, because when truth comes from authority, we know that it's unvarying. And you see this a lot with people who are very insistent about their, um, their beliefs. Uh, think of those two um, stick men again. Um, and you get this entrenchment between people who follow these different beliefs or follow different authorities. Um, now, I think for many people, I think they actually prefer this because the absolute conclusion gives people a sense of uh, certainty and security. Whereas the, the qualified conclusion that we saw earlier, I think makes people feel uncomfortable that things could change underneath them. So I think that's why many people find this more attractive in many ways. Um, okay, so normally you'd think that was it, but as you can see, there's a bit of uh, slide spare at the bottom. So we get a hint that this, we're not quite done yet. Um, so here comes the difficult bit. 
because somehow we have to relate this back to the world of observation. We somehow have to get back to the real world. Um, of course, we haven't made any observations yet. We've just listened to the, the guy on the telly. Um, so we call this process uh, canonical filtering because the observations that match the narrative are selected and those that don't match the narrative are rejected. And the, so they're filtered out. And what you're left with is the official canon of the narrative. Um, you can see how we've got similarities here with um, a, a religious system or a belief system. So right at the end then, we get back to observations. And you notice that in this model, observations are last, whereas in the, the first one, observations were first. Okay, so why am I droning on about all this? Um, it's all because of this. Um, the, these, these two little guys are never going to get anywhere like this because um, each thinks he's right and the other's wrong. The only way these guys are going to get anywhere is if they both agree to switch to the correspondence model. Okay, so um, moving on then. Um, so wh what is the TV delusion? Okay, so the TV delusion is our attempt to bridge the gap between these two, the two arguing stickmen. Um, now, they have to make a choice to choose correspondence over constructivism. But you can't make a choice between two things if you don't know there's a choice to be made. Um, so, you have to bridge the gap between the two guys. And um, what we do in our book is we focused on the mechanics of thought. Um, now, we felt that there are many books available in, in the so-called truth movement about various topics. And they all uh, focus very well on one particular subject or another. Um, but there aren't any books which tell you how to think. And uh, that's where we come in. They tell you what to think, but not how to think. Um, we hope that um, we might be put in a better place. The reader will be in a better place to um, understand the world around them. Um, so just merely telling people that 9-11 was an inside job uh, probably won't help them to start thinking critically. Uh, this certainly hasn't been my experience that it's been the case. Um, but helping them to understand the mechanism of their own thought processes uh, might just do that. So it was this realization, uh, coupled with those feelings of frustration we had, uh, that made us so passionate about uh, writing our book. Okay, so I'm going to carry on then. So what I said earlier was um, authority for us is the key. So the, um, the idea of authority, and authority external to yourself, is the, the key to all this. Um, and uh, so where does authority come from? So as we said earlier, for most of us, um, authority comes from the TV. And so many people will have their, their favorite news channels, which they believe to be better than the others. Um, it doesn't really matter that much, really, because all the major news channels, in cases like 9-11 and otherwise, tend to sing the same song. And it's this repetition of this narrative that comes from seemingly independent sources that enhances our tendency to believe. Um, so, of course, apart from the TV, there are sources of authority everywhere. Um, some of these are quite unexpected, like I said earlier. And I'm just going to uh, give you a couple of examples of this, which uh, struck me um, a few weeks ago. And so I'm just going to talk you through them. So the first example uh, was, uh, came from uh, Joe and I. We're in the uh, pub, as ever. Um, quite a lot of our key moments come in the pub. So. Um, and we were having a drink with a friend of ours, and we'd mentioned to him that um, we'd been to see David Icke in uh, Brixton in London a few weeks before. Now, um, before I go on, I want to say that I don't necessarily agree with everything David Icke says, but I think he's got a lot of stuff which I do agree with, and even when he's saying things that I don't agree with, I still like to listen to him, because I just find it interesting what he's got to say. And I guess that's kind of what it means to be open-minded. It's being prepared to listen to people even when you don't agree with them. Um, but my friend's reaction uh, was quite different to this. Um, he said, oh, David Icke, that's that bloke who goes on about lizards all the time. And <laughs> at that, he just refused to discuss anything he said any further. 
Um, and he said to me that you cannot respect anyone who goes on about lizards all the time. Right. Um, now, what I suspect my friend was doing, uh, perhaps subconsciously, is looking for that source of authority. So the suggestion was that David Icke might be a source of authority. He's decided that he's going to reject him. He's not prepared to accept any authority from him. And therefore, he then writes off everything he says and refuses to listen to any details. Um, again, you see that the focus is on the personality rather than the details of what's being said. So um, authority has the power over us to make us stop thinking. When we um, listen to authority from outside of us, uh, we have the tendency to stop thinking. We, we assume that, um, rightly or wrongly, um, someone else has done the critical thinking for us. And that means that we don't have to do it anymore. Um, now, I've got just one example of that and, um, before I move on. And this is an example from my childhood, actually, and uh, probably one of my earliest memories. Um, now, it's quite a long time ago now, as you can probably imagine. Um, and I remember being put in front of the television by my mother, and uh, it was to watch the Apollo missions. And the bit that always sticks in my mind is the bit when the uh, lunar module takes off from the surface of the moon. So I don't know if many of you are familiar, but the, the top half, which is called the ascent module, blasts off and leaves, leaves the lower half below on the moon's surface. That's called the descent module. And when it took off, I'd, I'd been waiting for this moment for days, so I was, I was sitting in front of it, riveted to the set, and um, I remember it taking off, and I spotted instantly that it didn't have any rocket engines. Um, all the other stages of the Apollo have engines underneath them with flames coming out of them, but this one had nothing. Um, so, of course, um, I pointed out to my mother, I said, Mum, why doesn't it have any engines? And... Uh, Quick on her feet, um, she said to me the following. She said, the reason it doesn't have any engines is because you don't need engines if you're on the moon. <laughs> now, yeah, that one, looking at it now, when I remembered it recently, that was my reaction as well. It was quite funny. But at the time, of course, it's, it was different for me because I accepted the authority of my mother and let the subject ride there. And... That was the, her statement, her statement of authority, was sufficient to stop me thinking about that subject for 40 years, um, which is a pretty powerful form of authority, in my opinion. Um, now, of course, I don't blame my mother. I'm not trying to sit here and uh, slag my mum off. Um, I was a really difficult child. Um, I was al always asking stupid, difficult questions. So it um, must have been a bit of a pain in the bum for her. So. Um, and incidentally, um, I did look at the clip again a couple of weeks ago and, uh, on YouTube and uh, still doesn't have any engines, so there you go. <laughs> no one's painted any on as far as I could tell. Anyway, um, moving on then. Oh, there it is, look. Now, sorry the picture's so rough. Um, it's the only copy I could find on the internet. So there's the upper half taking off there and... At the bottom of it is where you'd expect to see some engines and you expect to see some big flames coming out. Um, as you can see, there's nothing. Um, God only knows what force is propelling that thing upwards. Um, the hand of God, maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, let's um, move on then. So, um, one thing we noticed uh, that happened a lot when people believe in authority, uh, we found that... Um, they had a tendency to reject observation. And we see this tendency going on both in dogmatic traditional religion and in the belief system that stems from the TV. And I just want to go through now a couple of examples of this happening. Um, the first example is from a, a traditional religion. I've chosen Christianity, but um, I could have chosen any religion, so I'm not having a go at Christians or anything. Um, and then the examples after that come from the TV. So the first example is uh, Moses and the Red Sea. So, in this story, we're invited to believe the story that Moses somehow parted the Red Sea. Now, of course, in the real world, the uh, correspondence world, we know that we can never observe anyone parting any sea. To do this would require an evenly distributed force acting on both walls of water. The force would have to be greater at the bottom than at the top, and have to be varied 
continuously over the wall of water. And we've never seen anyone do this, and we cannot envisage any process by which this could be done. Um, now, in the constructivist world, of course, the constructive world um, advice, invites us to throw aside our observations, or lack of them in this case, and uh, enter into an unreal make-believe universe. Uh, so, um, now, of course, in this example, uh, people might point out that there are, um, there are actually very few people who believe this story, um, and that's probably true, although I have met a couple. Um, you do meet them now and again. So, moving in swiftly on then, let's uh, look at the next example. So, the next example is from the TV. Right, that's not what I was expecting. It's on there. How has that done that? Mm. Oh, oh sorry. No. Okay, we're back. So the next example is uh, uh, the free fall of Building 7 on 9-11. So the TV tells us that the Building 7 collapsed with the free fall acceleration and at the same time was crushed to dust. Now, um, it all, the TV also tells us that no other source of energy was present during the actual collapse. But back in the real world, we know that if all the potential energy of the tower was converted into kinetic energy, and that's what we mean when we say a free fall collapse, then there can be no energy left in the system to pulverize the building. Um, so then we're left with the question as to where did that extra energy come from? Um, and we're not talking about a mere trifle here. If, if Imagine yourself trying to break up the building with a sledgehammer. Um, think how long it would take and how difficult it would be. It, it's a lot of energy. So, you know, it can't just have appeared out of thin air. Um, so, once again, the constructivist world invites us to throw aside our observations and enter into an unreal make-believe universe. Um, now, it's not just that we've been told a lie in this case. It's much, much more serious than that. We've been invited into an unreal kind of fairyland where the impossible is somehow true. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about energy and, and conservation of energy. Now, at this point, some people might suggest that these laws themselves are simply just a product of truth by authority. Um, for many of us, we, we've learned these laws at school, and what is school other than a source of authority? Um, now, the big difference, of course, is that if you don't believe the laws of conservation of energy are true, you can simply conduct an experiment yourself to verify them. And I myself have done this at school, and I'm sure that many of you have as well. Um, so when you conduct an experiment and verify these things yourself, the source of authority becomes yourself. So and this, this is the difference between correspondence truth and truth by authority. In authority, you're, uh, truth by authority, you're bowing to the authority of other people, uh, whereas in this method, you're, it's, it's you who's doing the authoriz authorization, I guess you'd say. Um, now, let's move on then. So, 7-7. Seven, seven. Um, in the 772 bombings, we're told that hair bleach and black pepper was used by the so-called terrorists to construct their bomb. And so, um, hair bleach was the oxidizing agent, hydrogen peroxide, and black pepper was supposed to be the reducing agent. Now, back in the real world, the world of correspondence, we know that it's impossible to make a bomb out of hair bleach and black pepper. Okay? Now, Again, if you don't believe this, you can construct an experiment for yourself and become your own authority. You can go down the shop, buy the hair bleach, go down to Tesco's, buy the black pepper, mix them together, do anything you want, heat them up, perfectly safe, anyone can do it without harming themselves, let your kids do it, no problem. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a bleached cat that <laughs> may be sneezing a bit, I don't know. Um, so, once again, the constructivist world invites us to throw aside our observations and enter into a make-believe world. A world of uh, mad guys with beards making military-grade explosives in their bathtubs uh, with items purchased off their grocery list. Okay, so let's uh, move on then. So, next example. Chemtrails, or persistent ice. So, the TV, of course, is largely silent about these. Um, when it does comment, it tells us these are water droplets, water vapor, or ice crystals. But, once more, back in the real world, we know that water vapor, 
water droplets and ice crystals cannot exist in any volume of air which is above the dew point. And we know the air is above the dew point because if it were below the dew point, there'd already be a cloud there. Um, so ice crystals don't stay there, persist, broaden into thick stripes, and then grow in volume, turn into opalescent white sheets which cover the whole sky. They just don't behave like that. And once again, if you don't believe me, simple, you can conduct your own experiment. Okay, now I admit, probably a bit more difficult in this case, but you could get a big glass tank, you could fill it with some air above the dew point, you could get an atomizer and spray in some ice crystals in a plume, and you could watch to see what happens. And what will happen is those ice crystals will dissolve or sublime into the air and become invisible. They wouldn't stay there in a big cloud. Um, now, of course, in this case, um, for many people, the, the act of rejection of, of the observation just consists in their refusal to look up at the sky. So for many people, um, their belief system is uh, more powerful than their neck muscles. <laughs> um, now, I could go on like this, but first, they'll run out slide, and uh, secondly, at some stage, Frank will probably want to kick us out. So I'm going to move on from this, and I'm going to move on now to propaganda. Um, I'm going to start by uh, telling a little story about this, which I'll come to in a minute, and then Joe's going to take over and go through the notion of propaganda in a much, uh, to much greater depth. Um, so what I want to illustrate, really, is how, uh, how easily this stuff slips into our consciousness without our even being aware of it. Um, so um, I was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine a while back, uh, probably in the pub, and <laughs> we were talking about the uh, breakaway of Crimea from the Ukraine, which happened a few years ago. And my friend came out with this statement, Putin is a warmonger. Now, I asked him what he meant by this, and I asked him for some examples of wars he's supposed to have munged, or whatever the word is. And of course, um, he didn't have anything. Um, but he was still adamant that this was true, nevertheless. Um, so what can we say about this statement? The first thing is it lacks any kind of detail. It lacks any kind of observation. Um, and the second is it's focused on personality. So those two facts alone should be enough to give us the idea that this is a constructivist statement. Um, so how can we combat propaganda? What, what can we do about things like this? Um, well, the first thing we have to do is to ask detailed questions. So we can say, what wars has he actually started? We can ask, did he really do it? And we can ask, did he have good reason? Um, now, we haven't got time to answer these questions today. I, um, I'm sure many of you probably know the answers already. Um, but the important thing with the correspondence theory is that we ask questions. Um, the answering them is kind of interesting as well, but the asking them is the important thing. So um, the second thing we can do to escape propaganda is we can look at the, the broader picture. So we can say, um, what wars have other leaders started? So when we say a sentence like Putin is a warmonger or any other absolute um, statement, what we have to recognize is that these things are mere relatives. So this sentence has no meaning if all other leaders in the world turn out to be more of a warmonger. Um, so, for instance, in this particular case, it makes sense to compare the wars that Putin may or may not have been involved in with those that the US have been involved in. Now, here's the US ones. Now, my apologies to people in the back row. Uh, the, the font on this slide is a bit, a bit small, I know. I had a real job fitting everything in, as you can probably tell. So, um, I've got Syria at the bottom there twice because there's a supposed war against ISID, I, ISIS and uh, an, an actual war against Assad. Um, and obviously, we don't know where we're going next with this. Um, and these are just the most obvious uh, acts of US aggression, largely unprovoked over the last 50 years or so. OK, so um, that brings me to the end of my section. So now I'm going to hand over to Jo, and she's going to take you through some um, more interesting examples than this. Rich, so. <laughs> how do you use this? Thank you. Ah, that goes oh. right. Okay. Hey, 
Thank you, Simon. That was all very interesting stuff. Um, my bit's going to be a bit briefer than Simon's, so don't worry. You'll be able to go to the loo and have a break in a minute, so it won't be very long, okay? All right, so we're moving on to propaganda now. Um, so when we were writing the book, we looked into many subjects we felt were related to belief systems, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of these today, um, the two we thought were most important. So I'm going to start with propaganda, as up on the screen, and I'll move on briefly to talk about conformity. Okay, so what is propaganda? So one definition is that it's biased or misleading information that's used to promote a political cause or narrative. Um, in a way, you could think of it as a basic form of mind control uh, that could be used to force a population into submission. Okay, so why is the TV such an effective instrument for propaganda? So there are many reasons for this, uh, but the most obvious is the sheer prevalence of, of the TV. So globally, there are over 1.4 billion households that now own at least one TV. And that equates to nearly the whole of the developed world. And for those of you who've read Orwell's 1984, you could think of the TV as serving a similar function to the telescreen in his book. Okay, so when, when did this all start? So one of the earliest modern examples that we could find was the creation of the consumerist culture in the early 60s. And we all know this was done deliberately in order to create new revenu revenue streams for big corporations. By the late 60s, propaganda was being used for political purposes as well as commercial ones. So who was, it, who was behind it all? So one of the big players in the field was a guy called Edward Bernays, and you may have heard of him. Um, he became known as the father of propaganda, and we were pretty surprised to find out how influential he actually was. So here's a picture of him up on the screen now. So Bernays was an Austrian Jew um, who moved to America with his family when he was very young. He was a pioneer in the field of public relations, and his role primarily was to make American corporate and government campaigns more acceptable to the general public. Um, he, did, he did this by cleverly applying principles in mass psychology to increase the effectiveness of propaganda. And although this is a fascinating subject in itself, and we go into a lot more detail in the book, uh, what we're going to focus on here is just how the foundations he laid are still relevant today. So I'm going to show you a short clip now just to kind of outline this. We'll show you a short clip very soon, hopefully. <laughs> Bernays left an indelible mark on the cultural consciousness of the United States <laughs> and the world. And though he is... Bernays left an indelible mark on the cultural consciousness of the United States and the world. And though he has since passed on, his legacy remains with us today. The methods pioneered by Bernays have become commonplace. Like Bernays, PR firms around the world work to skew customer and civilian opinion in favor of one product, government action, or another. And, like Bernays, some firms work to justify wars, often while remaining largely invisible to the public. For example, have you ever heard of a firm called Hill and Knowlton? According to their website, Hill and Knowlton Strategies offers senior counsel insightful research and strategic communications planning throughout the world. In 1990, this firm led a propaganda campaign to build support for American intervention in Kuwait as Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces invaded. Yet many American citizens were emotionally distanced from this conflict between two foreign countries hundreds of miles away. And, sadly enough, many Americans couldn't identify Kuwait on a map, much less identify with its people. In an effort to build support, Hill and Knowlton didn't just employ Bernays' techniques, they expanded them. On October 10, 1990, a young woman using the pseudonym Nurse Naira told the Congressional Human Rights Caucus a terrifying story. According to her testimony, Iraqi soldiers were killing hundreds of premature babies in Kuwait, ripping them from their incubators. The story hit home, greatly affecting the legislators who heard it and, perhaps more importantly, influencing public opinion. President George H.W. Bush repeated this story several times while justifying an intervention in Kuwait. As the story grew in popularity, more rumors emerged that Iraqi forces were digging mass graves for Kuwaiti children, for example. 
The United Nations held a public forum to follow up on this news, and this meeting led to a UN vote approving the use of force against Iraq. As the 1992 documentary To Sell a War points out, the actions of the Hussein regime were brutal enough even without the tremendous influence of Nurse Naira's story. But here's the thing, that's all it was, a story. A cleverly crafted piece of fiction designed to manipulate the masses into bankrolling a war. The young woman calling herself Nurse Naira was actually Naira al-Sabah, the daughter of Kuwait's ambassador to the United States, and she had been coached by Hill and Knowlton. Members of Congress did not know her real identity. As the facts emerged, Amnesty International recanted their original support of the claims, and according to Andrew Whitley of Middle East Watch, within two weeks of the liberation of Kuwait, it became apparent that the incubator story was false. Hill and Knowlton was paid over $10 million by a group called Citizens for a Free Kuwait, composed of private Kuwaiti citizens and government officials. The Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States maintains that there was no disinformation campaign, though Hill and Knowlton consulted with him personally. This is only one example of how PR firms can affect public opinion. Today, over 100 years since the birth of Edward Bernays, the techniques he refined have become both profoundly effective and widespread. So what does this teach us? Of course, this doesn't mean that all PR is bad or that all information about war is propaganda. It does, however, mean that we must remain vigilant and inquisitive when presented with persuasive information. We must question our sources. The next time you hear a politician arguing for another war, remember to ask questions, to check the sources of the claims. Don't be taken in by well-written appeals to emotion. Okay. I hope this should, this should work now. All right, so propaganda today is woven into TV so tightly that in many cases we are no longer able to distinguish it from reality. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of this. So in news, it's rare these days to find a news story that doesn't contain some sort of propaganda to promote one agenda or another. And again, I'll just give you a few examples here. So we've got weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so, again, the TV, as we know, as we probably all know here, lies to us a lot more than we may think. Uh, for instance, just like we saw with the incubator story in the clip, uh, we were fed the lie that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And we all know how that ended up. Okay, slogans such as war on terror. Again, there are plenty of slo uh, examples of slogans in the news and on TV. Um, and the slogan, war on terror, for instance, was introduced shortly after 9-11 and used as a means to end, um, justify endless war. Okay, fake terror events. So we're subjected to fake terror events over and over again. Um, and exa uh, for example, we have false flag terror events such as 9-11 and 7-7. And then there are fake terror events such as Sandy Hook and the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, and these are all used to create an atmosphere of fear. And all, as we all know, a terrified public is a lot easier to control. Okay, so we have propaganda in films. Um, much of the output from Hollywood these days is there for the sole purpose of propaganda. And films such as the ones in the slide at the moment can certainly contain their fair share. And I'm sure many of you have seen at least a few of the ones up here. Okay, so predictive programming is essentially a planting of ideas or images into the subconscious mind of the viewer. And again, I'll just give you a couple of examples here. So we've got TV programs. Uh, and for instance, in the first episode of The Lone Gunman, which is a US TV series for those who don't know, a, pas a passenger jet can be seen being flown towards the twin, twin Towers, just missing them at the last minute. And this was aired just a few months before 9-11. Okay, so we also see it in children's programs and books. Um, so these days, we can see plenty of examples of, say, chemtrails cropping up in children's cartoons, programs and books. Um, and this image from a kid's cartoon is just one of many that I, I had a look at on the internet. Um, the result is that children will grow up thinking that chemtrails are normal. Uh, so that just about sums it up for propaganda. Um, we're just going to move on to talk briefly about conformity before the end. 
Okay, so what is conformity? So it's the tendency to align your attitudes, beliefs and behaviour with those of the people around you. Why is it so important? So it's important because it affects us all the time, whether we realise it or not. Every part of our behaviour is shaped by our instinct to conform to social norms and follow accepted beliefs. And even our private thoughts are affected. And there have been many, plenty of experiments that have shown how powerful conformity actually is. And I'll just list a few for you to have a look at, and we go into a lot more detail, obviously, in the book. So we have the Solomon Ash experiment, Mustafa Sharif autokinetic experiment, Stanley Milgram experiment, and Stanford Prison experiment. But today we're going to just concentrate on the Solomon Ash experiment. Okay, so here he is. Um, and Solomon Ash was a Polish-born Jew, and just like Bernays, he moved to America with his family when he was very young. And again, I'm just going to show you a short clip of his most famous experiment now. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left, and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, the fifth person with the white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. three, three. 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 But on the third trial, something happens. Two. 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 Uh, two. The subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. One. Ash found subjects went along with the group on 37% of the critical trials. One. But he found through interviews One that they went along with the group for different reasons. One. One. They must be right. There are four of them and one of me. Uh, one. This subject's yielding is based on a distortion of his judgment. He genuinely believes that the group is correct. One. 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 Two. One. Two. 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 I know they're wrong, but why Two. should I make waves? Two. In this case, the subject knows he is right, but goes along to avoid the discomfort of disagreeing Two. with the group. Here, the distortion is at the level of his response. Two. 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 In the previous experiment, Two. the naive subject stood alone against the group. Two. In this variation, Ash gave the naive subject a partner, here seated in the third position, who also gives the correct response. One. One. Two. One. Two. With a partner, yielding drops to only 5% of the critical trials compared to 37% without a partner. Although subjects report warmth and good feeling toward the partner, they typically deny that he played a role in their own independence. Two. The partnership variation shows that much of the power of the group came not merely from its numbers, but from the unanimity of its opposition. When that unanimity is punctured, the group's power is greatly reduced. Sometimes we go along with the group because what they say convinces us they are right. Yes. This is called informational conformity. But sometimes we conform because we are apprehensive that the group will disapprove if we are deviant. This is called normative conformity. The strength of the normative factor is shown in another variation carried out by Ash. In this variation, the subject is told that because he had arrived late, he would have to write his answers. Subjects in this private response experiment are exposed to the same amount of misleading information as other subjects, but they are immune from any possible criticism by the group. One. One. And this enormously reduces the pressure to conform. Conformity drops by two-thirds. Two. 
Ash's experiment is a classic. It reveals how people will deny what they see and submit to group pressure. It allows us not only to observe conformity, but to study the conditions that increase or reduce its occurrence. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. Um, okay, so just to summarize, I'm going to go through the main conclusions from Ash's experiment, uh, in case you were asleep while, while that was on. Uh, so <laughs> okay, so group pressure can make you think and say almost anything. Group pressure can be more powerful than your own senses. Um, and importantly, a collaborator can vastly reduce the effects of conformity. So you might be asking, how does this all relate to the TV? So firstly, the TV gives us the impression that there's a large group of people who've all adopted the same narrative. And this is what makes it such a powerful tool for conformity. Um, and often we make this false assumption that the many different news channels, each of which ped peddle the same story, as Simon pointed out earlier, are independent from each other. But in fact, they're a lot less independent than you might think. Um, and another reason is that the TV quite often tells us a certain opinion comes from a body of experts. Um, so we're much likely to, uh, sorry, less likely to question the narrative. Anyway, that just about sums it up for conformity. Um, we're just going to finish off just by um, basically going through a few key steps we can all take to reduce the TV's power to delude us and those around us. So how to think, not what to think. So this is crucial if we are to bridge the gap between those of us who know what's going on and those who don't. Question everything. So when we start to question things, we're on the right track to engage critical thinking. And this will help us move towards correspondence truth. Turn off the TV. So this is a, an obvious one, and, uh, but for many, not an easy task. Speak out loudly. Okay, so for those of us who do know what's going on, it's important that we do speak out about it in whatever way we can. Um, and although this can take a lot of courage, it's vital if we want things to change for the better. Okay, and everyone can make a difference. So as the Solomon Ash experiment shows us, it's always possible for a small group of dissenters to break the pattern of, of false belief. So there's still hope for us all yet. Okay, so we'd like to thank everyone for listening. And um, if you're interested to find out a bit more about our book, you can access a free sample of it on Smashwords, which is up there on the screen, or just find us after the talk. Um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon and Joanna. It went well. Now you had your debut. Uh, I think it could be an interesting book to give some of your friends who uh, have not eaten the, the red pill yet. Um, we just have a small break and then we will continue with reality uh, talk uh, with Mark Devlin. So uh, we are a little bit delayed now, so 10 minutes break and then you are back, okay? <laughs>